Our next speaker, Caroline McCracken Flesher, is head of the University of Wyoming Department of English. Her MA is from the University of Edinburgh, and her PhD is from Brown. Caroline's academic expertise is 19th century British literature and culture. Am I blowing people out of here well, no, it's with just my kind of sound? Okay. Um, Caroline's academic expertise is 19th century British literature and culture. As her departmental colleague, I can tell you that her expertise ex ex extends much beyond the 19th century. She ranges widely all over the literary and cultural map. Her books, published by Oxford University Press, include Possible Scotlands, Walter Scott and the Story of Tomorrow, and from last year, The Doctor Dissected, a cultural, a cultural autopsy of the Burke and Hare murders. Um, Caroline is a UW presidential speaker. She's a faculty senate speaker. She has won college awards for extraordinary merit in teaching and extraordinary merit in research, as well as the John P. Elbogen Meritorious Classroom Teaching Award, which is UW's highest teaching honor. Today, Caroline's going to show us just how classic literature participates in popular ideas of science and crime. Her talk is titled Jekyll and Hyde, Science and Scandal. Please welcome Caroline McCracken Flesher. Thank you. And I want to thank um, the uh, Sheridan College, I want to, the community college. I'd like to thank uh, the museum as well. Um, the town, we had a lovely reception last night. And at the beginning, or at the end of, of class's talk, somebody mentioned, why do we never learn from the mistakes of history? Uh, <laughs> and you will know that little saying, those who don't uh, learn from the mistakes of history are destined to repeat them. And this talk is all about people trying to learn from the mistakes of history, and sometimes it's very difficult, and sometimes you have to displace history, perhaps into literature, to work out um, what it is you really might be doing or how to get past a moment in history. That's what this is all about. Uh, and so in some respects, if we were to go back to class's model, it's also about uh, uh, stimulus investment and it's great to invest in buildings, but sometimes it's good to invest in those teachers as well in the long-term investment, not just the, the, the building. Um, so Jekyll and Hyde, Science and Scandal. And I'm going to tell you about a particular story. You may be surprised to see that I'm focusing on one of the less observed parts of Jekyll and Hyde, that it begins with a chapter called The Story of a Door. The Story of the Door. Mr. Enfield and Mr. Utterson are walking along a back street of London, and they come upon an odd-looking door. And Mr. Enfield um, says, did you ever remark that door? Two doors from one corner, the line was broken by the entry of a court. And just at that point, a certain sinister block of building thrust forward its gable on the street. It was two stories high, showed no window, nothing but a door on the lower story, and a blind forehead of discolored wall on the upper, and bore in every feature the marks of prolonged and sordid negligence. Now, this is interesting to me as a, as a literary studies scholar for a number of reasons. There are some things that get insisted upon here, and they're the things you don't expect. We are counting by doors. We are focusing on a door. And we're talking about a door that for some reason has not been used for quite a while, or it appears not to have been used, right? It's neglected, it's forgotten. And Mr. Anfield says very specifically, just in case we missed it, he says, did you ever remark that door? It's connected in my mind with a very odd story. Now we know the story that it's connected to, right? Uh, even if we haven't read Jekyll and Hyde, Jekyll and Hyde is now so much part of our cultural discourse, then we know this is gonna be the story about the, the, uh, Dr. Jekyll and his alter ego, Mr. Hyde. But there's something else going on here as well. Insofar as this is a door with a past, and again, an insistence, for close on a generation, no one had appeared to drive away random visitors or repair their ravages. So we got told numerous times, look at the door. And then we got told numerous times, it's something to do with the past. And here's why. This is the, this, these are the doors. This is in Edinburgh, where Robert Louis Stevenson grew up. And at the halfway down the Royal Mile, if you're heading from the castle down the ridge that's Edinburgh, down to Holyrood Palace, there's a little jog off on the right. And it's what was the old College of Edinburgh. And then just a little bit down below that, Surgeon Square. And Surgeon Square has this building. If you were going in, as I'm going in, it would be on your right. And this building is the sort of front door of Surgeon Square. 
Uh, it's where, you know, the doctors might have their tea or whatever. On the left are the dissecting rooms. And you'll notice that it has large windows high up. That's because whatever you're doing in the dissecting rooms, you don't really want people passing by, looking in, and seeing what you're doing, right? So they're high up and uh, inaccessible. And the story of these doors, Robert Louis Stevenson told twice. And he told it once, I will say, as Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde. And I'm sure you didn't know that. Um, and I'll tell you how. But before he did that, he told it as this story, The Body Snatcher. Now, this is a particularly interesting little story. He wrote it in 1881, or at least he got a good start on it in 1881. He didn't get around to publishing it until 1884, and thereby hangs another kind of tale that we will discuss in a moment. He publishes it in the Pall Mall Gazette, which was quite a uh, sort of shocker uh, little um, uh, magazine of its time. As soon as he published it, back up in Edinburgh, people started to write uh, complaining letters. This one is in the National Library of Scotland, and it's from a John Goodsir, who was related to a doctor. And John Goodsir wrote that this story should have been given to the public at all is a matter of very questionable taste. Mr. Stevenson, an Edinburgh man, should have thought twice before reviving the memories of one of the darkest series of crimes that have stained the annals of his native city. So there's something about this story that's peculiarly disturbing to Edinburgh and that is, in fact, a matter of Edinburgh history. So what is the story that he tells? Now, remember, he tells it as fiction. And in The Body Snatcher, it's actually uh, set down in England in the small par parlor of the George Inn in Debenham. And at the George Inn, Fetty's, an old drunken Scotsman, props up the corner of the bar every night. And nobody really knows anything about him except that he's got kind of squalid, he seems kind of depressed, doesn't really talk to anybody much, and, he's, and he has a medical background. Well, one night, someone important gets sick, and they call in the great London doctor. And as the great London doctor is passing through the hallway, he sees somebody. He catches eyes with um, Fetty's. So the great London doctor, McFarland, and Fetty's exchange a gaze. And Fetty says, did you think that I was dead too? And McFarland says, have you seen it again? And then, of course, the story has to be unpacked. McFarland flees into the night, um, treading on his expensive golden spectacles. And Fetty's gets to stay behind and tell the story. And the story he tells is this. They were students together in Edinburgh at a time when anatomy is the happening science, and it's you know, very, very um, uh, exciting to be part of this culture. And uh, anatomy is to the fore because in the 18th century, a doctor might have diagnosed you by looking at you. Obviously, it would be better if the doctor knew what he was, what he was talking about, right? Um, particularly if the doctor was going to cut into you at a time when to, to actually go to the doctor and to submit yourself to surgery pretty much was saying you had given up on life. Uh, because in all probability, you were, you know, you're going to die anyway, so you might as well give this a chance. Right. So anatomy is really important. You want the doctor to know what he's looking for when he gets out the knife. So anatomy is, is uh, very energetic, um, very important, um, and they are students in Edinburgh at this time. Problem about that is, in the practical study of anatomy, is that there's a very limited supply of bodies. Officially, you're only allowed to receive bodies from the gibbet, and even in early 19th century uh, Edinburgh, there weren't that many of that type of criminal around that there was a big supply. You were going to get maybe one or two bodies um, to the university in a year. So obviously, and this is where it becomes economical, big, <laughs> big demand, not enough supply. So there's a lot of body snatching goes on in and around Edinburgh. Um, not just in and around Edinburgh, it was such a trade that uh, graves stand empty um, all across the north of Scotland and all across the way into Ireland because they were supplying the Edinburgh doctors. So, out at night, um, retrieving bodies. Because they you know, could, could actually get you quite a lot of money, anywhere from seven to maybe, maybe even 15 pounds. It's a huge amount of money for the time. 
But of course, if you've got a market like that, uh, low supply, high demand, um, and you're disinterring bodies, or incidentally also snatching granny out from under the grieving relatives, or sometimes the grieving relatives were selling granny away before anybody had a chance to bury her. <laughs> Obviously, there was an alternate possibility for increasing the supply. And what happens is Fetty's uh, one night is receiving bodies with McFarland, and they are supplied with a familiar body, a girl of the town that they recognize. What should they do? They saw her recently. She was fine. They do nothing. Together, they decide to do nothing, because the doctor who presides over this establishment has said, ask no questions for conscience sake. Right? The higher good is the anatomy, which is a really important science. It's going to make a huge difference to contemporary medicine. It makes a huge difference to our medicine that um, it went through this phase. But they are to ask no questions for conscience sake. Well, you can imagine how that might impact the market. Shortly, Fettas and McFarlane are out with one of the suppliers a Mr. Gray, and Mr. Gray is somewhat obnoxious, and Fetty makes the offhand comment, when we dislike a dear friend of ours, we dissect him. <laughs> Shortly after that, McFarlane arrives at the door with a strangely familiar body. It's Mr. Gray. And now Fetty must say nothing, because he has already said nothing. And paradoxically, if dissection was a mode of detection, to find out what it, what it actually, you know, a natural causes um, produced a death, right? That's what dissection was about, detecting. Dissection also makes away with evidence. So they very promptly dissect Mr. Gray. Therefore, there's no evidence. And they've, they've fulfilled the medical imperative. They've had the body, they've learned from it, whatever from it. But this isn't the end of the story. This is such a moneymaker that the students are, are um, body snatching themselves out in the graveyards late at night. And one night, far from Edinburgh, in the rain, um, Fetty's and McFarlane are retrieving a body. And it is indeed the body of an old granny, right? So they're retrieving the body. They get her in the gig, right, nicely sprung little gig, going back to Edinburgh. And as they drive along in the rain, Granny, they, they wrapped her up, right? She sways over and leans her head on their shoulder. She's sitting between them. And then she sways over and lays her head on that shoulder. And then, you know. And it's dark, and it's raining, and the dogs start to howl. And they say, can't stand it any longer. We're going to stop and unwrap this package and see what's in it. And they unwrap it, and the light fell very clear upon the dark, well-molded features and smooth-shaven cheeks of a too familiar countenance, the long-dead and long-dissected Mr. Gray. <gasps> and that's the end of the story, right? Everybody panics, the, the gig runs away, leaves them in, you know, in the middle of the road. Okay. Now, this story was published in the Pall Mall Gazette. Obviously, that's a London journal. And the Pall Mall Gazette uh, had actually just turned down a story from Stevenson for not being scary enough. So the Pall Mall Gazette loved this story. And they advertised it. They really pushed it. They said it was weird. They sent out... Um, uh, advertising men with uh, dressed like corpses and carrying coffin lids. Okay. So obviously for London, this is just a, you know, this was a great scary story. Back up in Edinburgh, however, we know that John Goodsir didn't like it. And Stevenson himself had said, I sort of, I just couldn't bring it to completion because I, it was horrid. I took a scunner at it. It was something about it that I just made me very uncomfortable. I took a scunner at it. Well, what was Stevenson remembering, and what did people really want to forget? And the answer lies in one of the criticisms from that Edinburgh uh, John Goodsir. He said, in his letter, he said, why did he write 
K, and K being the name of the presiding doctor, the one who said, ask no questions for conscience sake. He says he might just as well have written Knox. This is Dr. Knox. Dr. Knox was the most accomplished of the Edinburgh anatomists in 1827 to 1828. He did his work around Surgeon's Square. He was actually in competition with the primary university teachers. Primary university teacher was Alexander Monroe III. Alexander Monroe III uh, followed Alexander Monroe II, who followed Alexander Monroe I, who was the one with the really good medical training. And Alexander Monroe III was rumored to read from his grandfather's lecture notes that said, when I was a young man in Leiden, which was a great medical center. So in other words, that, that wasn't the greatest medical training coming from the university, at least with regard to pathology and anatomy. So Knox, to some degree, is in competition with this. He's the independent guy. He's like Sylvan Learning connected to the university. <laughs> but he, and he's really good. Right? He is really good. Um, not just a good anatomist. He, was, he, was, he with his brother, um, uh, produced specimens. Uh, they they uh, worked in a museum. Um, and he was a charismatic speaker. So. In the fall of 1828, he had a huge number of students, 504 students. He had to meet them in three sessions. And this is his ad for that session. It promises a full anatomical demonstration on fresh subjects. Okay. Um, think, about, think about the basic math. Now, I don't do anatomy, so although I've now been in a lot of ana anatomical museums and seen things I never expected to see. But think about it. You have 504 students. If most of those students are actually going to the anatomy labs, how many corpses do you actually need for them to have practical experience, each to have practical experience? Quite a few. Certainly much in excess of the one that you're going to get from the gallows every year. How on earth are you going to meet that market. Well, these fellows will help you. <laughs> William Burke and William Hare. William Burke and William Hare uh, were Irish, uh, living in uh, Edinburgh. Hare ran a lodging house with uh, Mrs. Hare. And one night, old Donald died and owed rent. Old Donald had no ap apparent connections in Edinburgh. And Hare was going to be out the rent. So between Burke and Hare, they realized that they could take old Donald down to the anatomy labs and sell him to the doctors. And here's the supreme irony of this. They were looking for Dr. Monroe. But they met an enthusiastic young man who was one of Dr. Knox's students. And he said, go to Dr. Knox. And they did. And they sold for quite a bit more money than they expected which then turned them into manufacturers as well as suppliers. <laughs> and I'm just going to focus on two or three of the most known murders. This was Daft Jamie. Daft Jamie was a very well-known figure in Edinburgh. Um, in the terms of the, of the day, he was simple. Uh, and he would go along the high street begging. People knew him extremely well. And he was, re he was remarkable both because I mean, they knew what he looked like but he, also, he never wore shoes, and his feet were distinct. So they murdered Daft Jamie. They loved it. Their, their modus, mode of operation was get somebody really good and drunk and cheap whiskey, and then, eventually, and then suffocate them. And you'd hold the nose and lean on the chest. I, I'm not recommending this, by the way. And, <laughs> uh, but anyway, that's what they did. Daft Jamie, however, wouldn't get drunk, so that death was a little bit more violent than most. Mary Patterson, a girl of the street, again, somebody quite well known around Edinburgh. And the last case, old Mrs. Doherty, who had come from Ireland looking for her son and had the misfortune to fall in with Burke in the high street. And he said, oh, you're from Ireland, so am I. Um, let's go have a drink together. <laughs> and she's the only one that was retrieved. Because think about it, they're supplying corpses to the doctors for dissection. So your information simply disappears. 
but Mrs. Doherty was found in a box in Dr. Knox's dissecting lab, not yet unpacked. And by the time they'd done, it was 16 that we know of, delivered to Dr. Knox's door in Surgeon Square. This is actually rumored to be a portrait of Mary Patterson, because Mary Patterson's musculature, she was a girl of the town and a very attractive one, um, was so, dis so attractive that uh, they actually kept her pickled in um, alcohol uh, for months until it was time to do the lectures on musculature. And in the meantime, um, because medicine and art were closely related, they sketched her. So they got to look at her for quite a few months. All right, now here's the question. Daft Jamie was really well known around Edinburgh. Did nobody recognize that they'd just seen him and he was fine? Ferguson, the student who was Dr. Knox's receiver of bodies, played a role in very quickly removing the head and the feet. Why the head and the feet? Those are the pieces you might know. Did nobody recognize Mary Patterson? Actually, the rumor was somebody had, but you know, those were medical students of their era. They were lively guys. And somebody said, oh, you know, I saw her just yesterday. She was fine. But nobody said anything. So had anybody known that these bodies were illicitly procured? Who should have known? They're bringing them to a medical establishment. Could nobody tell that they were murdered? Actually, for the period, that might have been difficult to figure out. Although Dr. Knox is one of the people who looks at post-mortem effects in the eye, perhaps he might have registered. So who did know? Well, the law decided that the person who was going to take the rap, which might not be the same thing, was William Burke. And William Burke was hanged in the lawn market in Edinburgh. His corpse was then conveyed to, irony of ironies, Dr. Munro, <laughs> who performed a ceremonial incision. 30,000 people filed past the corpse and had a look at it. About the same amount, it's the same number is actually turned up for the execution. And thereafter, Burke was indeed dissected, and if you're interested, you now can go visit William Burke, who hangs in uh, the Anatomy Museum in Surgeon's Hall in Edinburgh. Side by side with a few pouches made from his skin and things like that. But what did the doctor know? This really concerned Edinburgh, because after all, Edinburgh had been riding high post-enlightenment on ac academic achievements, particularly in medicine. It was a place to go. Charles Darwin went to Edinburgh to study medicine, but he did not like Dr. Monroe and left. We don't know if he ever could have sat in a class with Dr. Knox. Dr. Knox wouldn't say a thing. And after all, what case was there to prove against him because Mrs. Doherty, when she was found in his dissecting lab, was still in the box. They hadn't unpacked her. And Knox spent the next year or so saying nothing, slightly manipulating the investigative committee that was set up to look into this, fighting with the members of that committee, even though they were his friends and he'd had some part to play in getting them on the committee, and just generally saying nothing, threatening legal action against people who implicated him in any way. So much so that um, the next few years in Scotland, there are lots of books trying to, both, both fictive and factual, trying to unpack what happened. That's a really unfortunate way for me to say that under the circumstances. <laughs> but anyway, trying to understand what had happened, trying to get the truth of it, and the thing is that they came close to Birkenhair. They could figure out Birkenhair. Um, Burke and Hare was basic economics. They wanted to make money, no morality involved. Uh, 
they fit within the determinations of religion at the time. Clearly these two guys were reprobate and what was more, they were Irish. <laughs> the London Times wrote columns that, that uh, said, oh well, it was, this, it, was, it was Scotch entrepreneurial behavior linked with um, Irish modes of procurement. <laughs> <laughs> but nothing about the doctor. And so authors and, and, and Edinburgh itself, people have become more and more anxious about understanding what had happened. And as they're becoming more anxious, there's a competing story coming to the fore. And the competing story is that you know, Knox was a great guy, and he was. Uh, biographies start to be published by his students, and he had served in, in Africa. Uh, and the biographies repeat stories like this, mounted on his famous Arabian mare that could travel many miles, apparently without the slightest fatigue, armed with a rifle of marvelous aim, single-handed, Knox achieved wonderful things. He had served after Waterloo. Uh, Waterloo was a big impetus to the anatomy industry because think about all those corpses in one place, what a great uh, opportunity for study. And the story of medicine too was changing. So not just the story about Knox, but the story of medicine because medicine was becoming professionalized. And so you can see these people in their rows before, medicine had been something practiced by surgeons derived from barbers. Right? So they had great practical knowledge. Uh, apothecaries, that was more a matter of sort of experiment and substances. Physicians had some amount of training, but remember, not in actually you know, laying hands on anything and figuring it out in that way. So this was a good thing. But as doctors are developing more professional knowledge uh, and their, their uh, class is going up, so as opposed to being barber surgeons, which are apothecaries, which was kind of low class, now you could be by appointment to the queen. And Robert Ferguson, remember that student who received bodies for Dr. Knox? Became the sergeant surgeon to Queen Victoria. So there's vindication for you if you want in terms of medicine. Medicine was focused a lot on ethics from uh, about 1808 forward. But ethics were a matter of how you behaved to your colleagues. Doctors were not nice to one another. So this is where um, medical confidentiality, confidentiality actually first came up. It was in not um, saying mean things about your colleagues. It wasn't a matter of good medicine and treating your patients appropriately. So there's a, there's a, a, a tension then between the desire of getting the story properly told and how medicine was changing, which would have said that the doctor is a professional, the doctor necessarily has secret knowledge, and the doctor doesn't have to tell you a thing. And that's where this anxiety is coming up. Before this story fades completely out of Scottish cultural memory, what are people going to do about it? How are they going to retrieve it? And that's where Stevenson comes in. Now, John Goodsir, who said, why did Stevenson tell this story, said Stevenson should have read that biography that we saw, the one that said how wonderful Knox was. Well, he may have seen that, but between 1880, 1884 when he published uh, The Body Snatcher and 1886 when he published Jekyll and Hyde, this book comes out. And this book looks at just at the medical and legal aspects of the case of Dr. Knox and Burke and Hare. And is quite explicit in some of its stories about Dr. Knox, they're not the nice ones, and says Knox seemed a greater criminal even than Burke and Hare. And so I'm gonna to suggest to you that Stevenson gets at this story, it's a story that when he told it straight, people didn't like it. So he's gonna go through the back door in the neighborhood of Dr. Jekyll. Now, obviously enough, this is a story that's set in London. It's a story we're told about psychology. It's a story, it's the, one of the first places you'll see that word used. It's a story about, based on Darwinism, you know, Mr. Hyde is young and ape-like and springy. Um, and most obviously, how could it be a story about anatomy because actually it's a story about chemistry? Well, let's take another step to the side. Medicine is metaphor in this story. Stevenson knew a lot about medicine. He had been chronically sick with lung complaints whenever he was younger. He had taken treatment in Dunblane, the cold part of Scotland, in Pitlochry, the colder part of Sto Scotland, in Davos, the really cold part of Switzerland, and in Saranac Lake, the absolutely frigid part of New York. 
which is why eventually, no doubt, he then decided to stay in Samoa, which was warm and balmy. <laughs> but he also wrote about his student days in Edinburgh. When he's explaining where the story of Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde comes from, he talks about it as a dream. And we say, oh, well, that says something about psychology. And we forget to look at what, the, what he dreamt about. And this is what he says he dreamt about. He studied at Edinburgh College. It's third person. He dreamed persistently enough to leave a great black blot upon his memory. There's something about memory and dreams that's problematic. In his dream life, he passed a long day in the surgical theater seeing monstrous malformations and the abhorred dexterity of surgeons. Now, Stevenson did not study medicine at all. So it's an interesting thing for him to remember and to dream about. And all night long, he climbed the stairs of an Edinburgh tenement, those tall, tall buildings, brushed by single persons passing downward, beggarly women of the street, poor scarecrows of man. Now, these are many of the components of the Burke and Hare story, because Burke and Hare preyed on Edinburgh's underclass, the people who still lived in those tenements in the early 19th century, took them to the doctor who dissected them. And here's the thing. A simple draft restored him. Stevenson says, this was me. Right? This is actually a story of mine. Um, I was having those dreams, and I went to the doctor, and I got the transformative draft. Okay. Stevenson also knew that you could use medicine to manipulate. Um, his parents, uh, he was often running away from his Edinburgh parents, I have to say. And uh, he figured out quite early in London that in 1873 that he went to the doctor and the doctor gave this prescription to his mother. Lou's lungs are delicate and just in the state when disease might very easily set in. When I ask, mother says, if I ought to go abroad with him, because he's been told to go abroad, Dr. Clark says, no, he wants a complete change of everything. <laughs> and the next few years of Stevenson are fascinating because he'll say, I'm coming back from Davos, uh, but the doctor says, I really mustn't stop in London or Edinburgh to meet you. I must go straight to the Highlands, so I might as well just stay here. Or when his father was ill and thinking of going to, to Davos, Stevenson said, well, the doctor says, I can only come so far down the mountain, and since you can only come so far up, it's just not going to work. <laughs> so obviously, medicine allows you to change a story, to change a narrative. So coming back to Dr. Knox and how present he might be in Jekyll and Hyde, there are lots of, of interesting pieces. I'll give you just a few. In the 19th century, uh, one of the aspects of medicine that was particularly of interest was the nature of the brain. And we all know about phrenology and you know, studying the bumps in the head, but at the same time, there were lots of theories that were trying to address gaps in memory, something Dr. Jekyll has. The double brain, right, physically double, did that also mean you were mentally double? The asymmetrical brain, somehow out of balance. And there were issues that came up in the context of Dr. Knox, too, because that was one way of explaining after the fact, how could somebody who looked so good on the outside and be such a good doctor potentially have such a blind spot or such amorality? Dr. Knox's theories also inform how Jekyll and Hyde works. Dr. Knox uh, was a transcendental anthropologist. Uh, uh, of uh, anatomist. So that he was interested in generalizing um, physiological theories from what he observed. And this specific one, he observed that different species, particularly fish, display the same anatomical phenomena in their young, but diverge in maturity. So he says the history of the genus is embedded in every species. Right, so there's, there's a plenitude in us, but only part of it is realized as we grow older. What makes the difference? To institute a species, all that is required is to omit or cause to disappear some parts of the apparatus already existing in the generic being. So we're different because something is downplayed or taken out. That's how you get to Mr. Hyde. Because for Mr. Hyde, something is left out. 
Jekyll says his reason for, for being, becoming Mr. Hyde is I, for my part, from the nature of my life, advanced infallibly in one direction. It was the moral side. And what's he looking not to do? He's, he's looking to, take, to suppress that moral side so that he can have a fine time being Mr. Hyde. This is also part of Knox's theory because if Knox was a transcendental anatomist who was interested in physiology, he was also interested in speculating anthropologically on top of that. And that became a moral theory where moral capacity distinguishes survival, he said. Now, where, what's interesting about this is that um, this is one of the drivers of late 19th century medicine where um, it was thought that if you were sick, it was probably your own fault. And uh, Stevenson, for instance, at Davos, and I can't see it quite so well, but Davos, not only do, were you there taking the water or the air, but common sense and a strong will are the great means of recovery. So Stevenson was there to develop a strong will and therefore cure his lungs. And what's missing from Dr. Jekyll? What would the prescription be if you were Dr. Knox? Well, a good dose of moral fiber. Still, how do we get from anatomy to chemistry? In Edinburgh in the 19th century, the focus shifted from anatomy through chemistry to pharmacology. And James Young Simpson, who is the popularizer of chloroform, lived in Edinburgh and lived in Edinburgh catty corner from the Stevenson family. Stevenson's best friend was young Walter Simpson, the son. Over in Glasgow, Lister was working on antiseptics and moved to Edinburgh, where he treated this guy, William Ernest Henley, a poet and friend of Stevenson. Stevenson went to visit him, and Henley wrote um, at length about his experiences in hospital. He has hospital poems. He describes you know, the, the surgery of the time, a long, he, he had foot problems, a long cut across the foot from ankle to ankle, laying open the affected bone, scooped out gouge and pliers. Sorry, it's not lunchtime yet, we've got a while to recover. <laughs> this cavity was filled with strips of lint in carbolic acid. Now, if that's the surgery, then it's small wonder that in his hospital poems, he wrote a hymn to chloroform. <laughs> Behold me waiting, waiting for the knife. A little while, and at a leap I storm the thick, sweet mystery of chloroform, the drunken dark, the little death in life. This is why, by the way, um, it, about the 1860s, they say this is the moment when medicine started to cure people because you had anesthesia and antisepsis. And Stevenson experienced both. When he got to uh, San Francisco in the 1880s, one of the things that he had done to help improve his health was have all his teeth removed. And <coughs> reading his letters and studying, um, it is apparent that uh, he underwent anesthesia and he probably also benefited from antiseptics. But at the same time as pharmacology is making major advances, it was actually very difficult to tell the difference between what was good and what was bad medicine just as it had been difficult to tell about anatomy earlier in the, in the century. Because, think about this, you know, hairdressing is cocaine. Now, this imprecision in pharmacology and in diagnosis and in prescription wasn't always a problem. So for Stevenson, as long as he was taking just big doses of fresh air, it's probably fine. But he also was into self-medication. For instance, he really liked Gregory's powders. Now, Gregory's powders are a legitimate medication. They are a preparation of rhubarb. So for somebody who was constantly complaining about his digestion and describing colorfully um, bouts of diarrhea, possibly the medication was the problem. <laughs> his wife, Fanny, dosed herself with arsenic and lemons. And side by side with the story The Body Snatcher in the Pall Mall Gazette, there's this, which is an ad for Beecham's powders. Again, Beecham's powders by this time wasn't going to kill you. It was largely a laxative. But it's very much a piece of quack medicine because look at all the things it's supposed to cure. You know, now when, when somebody advertises a drug on TV, it says it will do this one thing for you. Watch out for all the side effects. 
This is the claim is it will do everything for you. It has cured thousands. It will deal with female complaints as well as headaches. Um, and that's the mark of quack medicine. Side by side with that is a story of, on Pasteur and his uh, discoveries about in organic chemistry about rabies, which were perfectly accurate. But the next week, another doctor writes in and says, completely made up, quack. So you couldn't tell the difference. So what does Stevenson do with all of this? Here's the problem, or a problem. One of the ways of trying to sort out this medicine was what a gentlemanly doctor was like, who you could trust and consult with, and a businessman. And they start separating out doctors according to that. The person who will sell you, you know, the red or blue bottle, bad. The person who will charge you an arm and a leg for looking at your arm and leg, good. <laughs> so, and doctors, to show that, separated their private lives from their professional lives. And there are architects' designs and houses all over Britain um, for doctors that have very clearly demarcated spaces for the family and the upper class element of being a professionalized doctor and then the sales at the front or the, the door for the patients. Rather like you would have the door for the, for the guests and the door for the servants, same thing. You had the door for the family and the guests and the door for the patients. <coughs> And I would suggest to you that Stevenson is thinking to some degree about this when he decides which door to choose to go after Dr. Jekyll through chemical medicine. Stevenson knew about both sides of chemical medicine because after all, remember, he was living across, or when he was small, he was living across from, from um, the uh, Simpson family. And at the Simpson family's uh, dinners, it wasn't at all unusual for Professor uh, Simpson to provide all kinds of interesting, interesting substances to inhale, to drink, et cetera, to test scientifically. And after testing them, guests would slowly descend under the table. He knew probably about the really bad side of this. Horace Wells, the dentist, who experimented with chloroform, experiment didn't take got addicted to chloroform and ended up assaulting prostitutes by throwing acid over them and then stabbing himself in the bath. So that, so that this also brought out the monster in the doctor. The notion of chemistry is transformative. It could show you something good. It could show you something really bad. <coughs> People were really enthusiastic about anesthesia and its side effects from early um, in, in this medical period. This is Humphrey Davy. Just a, a, again, another peon to, um, to chemistry. Yet are my eyes with sparkling luster filled, yet is my mouth replete with murmuring sound. And he writes poetry about it. There were exhibits where you could go along, kind of like a party. Now, now we bring the hypnotist, then they brought the bottle of nitrous oxide. And everybody tried it out and then said silly things. People behaved strangely. See, he's got his, his bladder of nitrous oxide there. And they talked a lot. So much talk that the, that particular ad says they seem to retain consciousness enough not to say or do that which they would have occasion to regret. <laughs> but the thing about um, this was it actually took the lid off, it took, stopped you from editing what you said. So now, how does this get to Dr. Knox? Well, if the thing was that Dr. Knox would not speak, this was a way of getting someone to speak. And it's really interesting to, to read what the transformation produces between Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde. And this is actually Dr. Jekyll, Dr. No, Mr. Hyde transforming into Dr. Jekyll. He reeled, staggered, staring with injected eyes. He seemed to swell. His face became suddenly black, and the features seemed to melt and alter. Now, that is actually a description of what something looks like as it's being dissected. And there's that odd word in there, injected. That's a word of art. It's a word used in medical preparation. If you want to save the, um, the more liquid, the more the organic parts of the body, as opposed to the bones are easy, you inject veins with wax so that you can then separate them out and see them. And as for the doctor, when he's describing what happened to him, he says, certain agents had the power to shake and pluck back the fleshly vestment. He doesn't say, I turned into a different person. He says, shake and pluck back the fleshly vestment. It's the language, again, of anatomizing something. <coughs> 
And he says, I ended up severed from my own face and nature. So are these really connecting doors between Jekyll and Hyde and Dr. Knox? There's a, l a couple other things that are just in passing interesting. In the 19th century, it became, uh, if people were worried about doctors as anatomists after Dr. Knox, they were worried about doctors as pharmacologists too because the 19th century produces a whole rash of doctors as poisoners. Uh, do most notably the Scot, Dr. Cream, who in America managed to do away with most of his family either because he was trying to poison them or he was a quack and didn't know what he was giving them. And Knox <coughs> had been talked about in connection with chemistry for a good, oh, more than 20 years when Stevenson started to write because Knox was not a particularly nice person to many people and the, the way of describing that is Knox was not <coughs> sufficiently gratified by the pouring forth of the Tofana spirit of his sarcasm, Tofana being a poison. He beho behoved to hold the phial with refined fingers <coughs> and rub the liquid into the raw with the soft touch of love. Also, the description of Dr. Jekyll's house is a standard doctor's house, right? It has the front door <coughs> where Mr. Arson goes in. It has the back door where Mr. <coughs> Hyde goes in. More interestingly though, Mr. Hyde goes into what is now a chemical lab. That lab was once an anatomical theater. Over the generations, the old doctor who lived there, Dr. Denman, sold his house to Dr. Jekyll. The first doctor was an anatomist. This doctor is a chemist. And so anatomy and chemistry meet very explicitly in Dr. Jekyll's house. So if this were a knock-knock joke, given that it's all about doors, I would have to say that when you knock-knock at Dr. <coughs> Jekyll's door, there's at least the possibility that the person coming to the door is in fact Dr. Knox. <laughs> now, <laughs> I'd love to take your questions and I'd love to hear your input too. <laughs> yes, he was. Yeah, he passes through um, on the way, in uh, 1879 I think it is, on the way to San Francisco. It's one of those classic moments when he's running away from the parents. He has not told the parents he's leaving. He decides, and this is, this is also to do with you know, metaphor and how you construct stories, he has decided that it would be really good to take the emigrant ship because that would be good, good data. You know, he's a well brought up Edinburgh boy. You know, he, doesn't, um, uh, he, uh, he, he has somebody to look after him in the evening you know, and put the hot water bottle in his bed. And uh, he decides he's gonna rough it um, and get good material on the way. But he doesn't quite travel steerage. He travels a level above steerage. He writes a lot about that, and his father then suppressed it actually because it was too gory, you know, not acceptable for middle class Edinburgh. And then he takes the emigrant train across the country. And he gets to uh, Council Bluffs, and he's really interested in everything. He's interested in the Chinese train, he's uh, um, interested in how Native Americans uh, interact with the train, all kinds of fascinating stuff. And then he gets out of Council Bluffs, and the next chapter is called The Desert of Wyoming. <laughs> By the time he gets to the Desert of Wyoming, he is a relatively fragile person, and he's been traveling relatively rough now for quite a while, and so I don't know, maybe, maybe Gregory's powders are kicking in, I'm not sure, but he's, he's very unhappy and very ill. And so as he goes through Wyoming, what he sees is rocks and more rocks. And that's about all he says, and then he keeps going. <laughs> But it's, it's at the end of that trip um, that he then uh, ends up in, in San Francisco very ill and uh, does in fact then end up having the teeth extracted. So in, in pretty gory ways. One of, uh, the, the, uh, the piece about uh, the tooth extraction actually was at a Stevenson conference and a medical historian who's a dentist came and uh, explained to us what this would actually have meant in contemporary times, complete with all the smells of ether and everything. This was before 9-11, so you could carry things like a canister of ether on a plane if you had brought it to, to Saranac Lake, the coldest place in the country, right, um, to demonstrate. And uh, none of us have ever forgotten that particular lecture. <laughs>
okay, I can actually answer that. Because <laughs> I've been in a lot of weird museums to do with this now. Um, are Stevenson's teeth from the San Francisco extraction uh, uh, saved? No. However, Mrs. Stevenson, remember that family thing? Mrs. Stevenson saved everything from when he was little. And you can go see Robert Louis and Stevenson baby book at the Beinecke Library. You can see his pipe. You can see his hat. You can, and I haven't actually gone looking for his teeth, but I would not be at all surprised if they have Robert Louis Stevenson's baby teeth. <laughs> okay, then I have another question, too, which is I, I, um, that's kind of really powerful by the time you got to the quote about um, Jekyll talking about being severed from my own nature and the flesh stripped back and that, that his own struggle to figure out what's me and what's not me. But if, um, if Mr. Hyde isn't a transformation into a totally different being, does it work when Jekyll tries to say, I was severed from my own nature because the body beneath, when the flesh is lifted, that is literally your own nature. Yes, yes. So here's the interesting thing. Um, going back through the inheritance of the term autopsy, the etymology of the term autopsy, it's actually constructed such as, and there are long articles about this by medical historians, it's about looking at yourself. The word autopsy actually is about looking at yourself because you're learning about yourself by looking at the inner parts of a body. So it really is, then, and then medicine, of course, turns it around to your benefit in terms of actual medical practice. So yeah, and, and you had a question. What, what was your path for getting involved in this discovery? Okay, um, I am very interested in, and I think this, this connects with class in an interesting way, I'm very interested in why we tell the stories about ourselves that we do. Right, so economic stories are uh, tremendously powerful. Um, and so much so that, that you know, stories can get in opposition with one another, even when, as, as class suggests, that they interlock much more. But we, we seize the particular types of stories. And in Scotland, the obvious story would be you know, kilts and Jacobites and all that stuff. Um, so if you go to, to uh, uh, Edinburgh, you'll see that story all over the place. This is also a story that is insisted upon. It gets told again and again and again and again. And of course, Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde gets told again and again and again and again in movies. But the very specific link, um, you know, growing up in Britain, you probably know the story of Burke and Hare, and I, and I did. But I was working on another Scottish author called Walter Scott, who is a major figure on telling the stories by which the nation is known. So successfully that then other countries started to copy this way of telling stories. And in 1828, he was the president of the Royal Society of Edinburgh. Now, that was quite unusual for a royal society to be both scientific and literary, but the Edinburgh one was. And so Scott is one of the people who was approached to serve on the committee that was going to investigate this. And Scott refused uh, in a couple of interesting ways. He said of Dr. Knox, he shall ride off on no back of mine as if he was a corpse being taken from, the, from the, the graveyard. And he said, I refuse to whitewash this much to be suspected individual. And he thought that the committee was going to be some kind of whitewash on behalf of some important things, you know, enlightenment, science, and everything else. But Scott also thought that um, particularly the Irish underclass, and they were the underclass in Edinburgh at the time, the economic imperative, I mean, it was just logical. He understood how it could have happened. Uh, he didn't like it at all, but he thought, he thought that the story needed to be told by the people involved in it. And he thought specifically, he said, that the doctor needed to speak for himself. And so a lot of people actually requested that, that Scott would tell the story, that he would write the story and thereby somehow put it to bed. You know, if you tell a story right, that's the end of it. And he refused. And so the story really takes off in the newspapers. There are all kinds of amazing pop culture, folk culture things in the newspapers about this, all kinds of speculations. And so by, by not telling the story right then, I then, then became really interested in how, it, how a story goes from inadequately told to told all over the place and still a story that has trouble closing down. And in, in my kind of study, what you do when you come across something like that, you're trying to figure out the why, right? And what it, what it tells you about how culture works. And um, there are theories about 
individuals, and when individuals suffer tremendous trauma, so much that you've got no way of processing it. You can't turn it into the story and close it down. That's what trauma is. So you, that story keeps coming back at you. Um, you keep trying to escape it. It just digs in deeper so that every other horrible thing that happens to you brings back that story. And it began to seem a little bit like this is what is happening culturally in Scotland through from about 1828 up until, interestingly, this moment when Stevenson tells it. Lots of attempts to tell the story, none of them being able to sort of wrap it up. And Stevenson sort of wraps it up because he finally gets the doctor to speak. And from this point, um, the story turns into a different kind of thing. It becomes something eventually that turns into movies. And I think you s possibly noticed that one of the slides I showed for The Body Snatcher is actually from a 1940s movie of The Body Snatcher that starred uh, Boris Karloff and Bela Lugosi. And so the story goes different directions. And then having dealt with the doctor, then someone like James Bridie um, looks at the, like how all of Edinburgh might be involved in this and slightly complicit. And then more recently, um, it's become huge Edinburgh festival fodder for entertainment. But it was that moment of uh, that combination of things, sort of, sort of knowing the story, then being surprised to discover that Scott had been involved in the story, and even more surprised to see lots of people writing to him including people who were implicated in the story, saying, why don't you write this and we'll be able to finish it? And him refusing. That became fascinating. Yeah. What kept you back in that Yeah, interesting question. <coughs> Dr. Knox um, stays on in Edinburgh for a while, then pretty much is pushed out of the university. And remember, he's pushed out by people like Monroe, who's not the greatest doctor. Right? Monroe is the person that students used to throw peas at to wake him up in lectures. Uh, so what's left, you know, is, is a problem. So Knox is pushed out. He goes to Glasgow for a while. Uh, he ends up in London at the cancer hospital, where he's, you know, excellent, excellent surgeon, really good at his job, knows what he's looking for, great. He talks a lot, and his biographer, Lonsdale, who was a student of his and also an assistant of his, talks about um, that someday he was going to tell the story and that it would exonerate him. But he never does. And so he dies in the 1860s, 1862, I think, and the story remains to be told and remains sort of anxious for people. But then they, then they start to come closer to the doctor once he's, once he's dead. They feel like they can be more direct about it. The stories up until then sort of come close and then they veer off and end up being about Burke and Hare, not the doctor. And so Stevenson is the one who then focuses quite narrowly on the doctor, both in The Body Snatcher and in Jekyll and Hyde. Yeah. Did Jameson ever talk? The, the person who was actually getting the bodies in? Isn't that what you said he was the receiving person? Oh, Ferguson? Ferguson. Ferguson. Um, Ferguson does not. No. <laughs> Ferguson stays mum. Uh, and after all, he's got a really good paying gig down at the palace, so why would he mess that up? Uh, and, and it's interesting who does and who doesn't, but he does not. The, the, uh, and, and for many of the doctors, there are a lot of medical um, comments on it, but, but they go obliquely toward, uh, that, that toward the Anatomy Act, um, that uh, the current state, stage of supply of corpses means that doctors who are elite beings have to deal with criminals. Therefore, you need to have a different mode of supply of bodies such that we are not forced to consort with criminals. And the Anatomy Act changes the whole mode of supply by, in fact, um, saying that uh, uh, if you die in a poor ho house and are unclaimed, that is how bodies get supplied to doctors. It, takes, it also takes, the, you know, which, it, which in itself is highly problematic if you think about it. If you're poor, then you automatically go to the doctors. It takes, however, from, from 19th, the 19th century perspective, it takes the um, stigma of being criminal out of donating your body to the doctors. I mean, who would donate your body if it was gonna say you were like a criminal? And so donation starts from the Anatomy Act. Uh, but, it, but this is one of the reasons why now law in Britain says that an anatomy school receives bodies in pieces, not as whole. Because um, uh, nobody can sh just show up with a body, basically, anymore. You're needing to meet with that, I think we have to, we'll bring the session to a close. And again, understanding that we can continue talking with Caroline when we have our roundtable at lunch. Thank you, Caroline.